And as always, feel free to put anything in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, and let's see. There I am. So what are we talking about tonight? We're going to talk about a couple of different things tonight. We're going to start by talking about something called data structures. What are data structures? Well, Python has two. Data structures are lists and dictionaries. That's what Python provides us. But why in the world do I, do I need a data structure? Well, I can, you know, define as many variables as I want. Um, and that's a very true statement. However, when you're dealing with a quantity of data that you don't know, let's say I'm working with a database and I'm retrieving you know, account information from this database for the last X number of years, I don't know how many records are coming back. So having a variable for each potential record doesn't make sense because it will never work. So what you need to do is you need to have flexible structures where you can add data and remove data that don't necessarily have to be defined you don't have to define every element in the data structure. You can define a data structure and have this elastic thing that can grow and shrink as your data grows and shrinks. So that's really why we have data structures, because it makes that much easier. And it gives us a way to organize our data, okay? Data organization is key when you're programming. Um, and, and there are two different types, as I said, lists and dictionaries. Lists, we've done a little bit with lists already because we, we got introduced to them when we were doing strings. This list is a little different because it's mutable, which means I can change it. Remember with a string, you had to kind of create another string? Well, I don't have to do that with lists. Every time I change a list, I don't have to create another list. I just change the list because I'm allowed to change the list. The other thing about a list is that they are ordered, which means they start at zero, they go to length minus one, and every single element in that list has a place in the list with an associated index number. That's the same as strings were. So, a dictionary is unordered, which means there's no index value. So what we've learned about, you know, strings and lists and index values, when you're talking about a dictionary, just throw it all away. Just get rid of it. Because dictionaries are what we call an associative data structure, which means I am providing a relationship between two different pieces of information Hopefully those pieces of information are related. One is the key, the left-hand side thing is the key, and the right-hand side thing, and you'll understand what I'm saying about that in just a minute, is the value. So it maps a key to a value. There is no index number when it comes to dictionaries. So let's start off with lists. We've been to lists before. We've talked about CRUD before create, read, update, and delete. So create means I can just create a new one. I can instantiate it. Read means I can get to the data stored in, the, in that list. Update means I can change the list. And delete means I can remove an existing list. So here's our little graph. Here we a list. So when I create an empty list, as we know, the list is the square brackets. I just have a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. I have an equal sign, and then on the right, I have open and close square brackets, and they're empty. So that creates an empty list. And that's good because sometimes you don't know how much data you're going to have in that list. So if you create an empty list, you can add things to it and you can take things away from it. So this is another way to create a list. 
this is a way to create a list that's already populated. Let's say I know, as an example, the directions that I'm going to allow my player to do. I'm going to allow them north, south, east, and west. So I can populate a list because that date is never going to change. So I want to keep that data kind of static. And so that's a time when I would use a populated list. Read, get at the stuff in the, uh, in the list. Exact same way I did if I wanted to get a character in a string. I have the name of the variable that contains my list. I have an open square bracket. Then I have the number of the index and a closed square bracket. That's how you read anything from any list ever. And then there's also a way, and we're going to talk about this a little more, of accessing it in a loop. And I bring this up here because we're going to see it again, but it is a concept that we need to get used to. Okay? So we have a for loop because for loops are made for collections. For loops are made for lists and dictionaries. I never use a while loop with a list or a dictionary. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so I have the for keyword, and then I have the in operator. So to the right of the in operator, I say range my list. What that will do is, in turn, it will pick every element out of that list. And it will put the value of whatever the element in the list is into a variable called Elm. Now, Elm could have also been Fred. The name Elm has nothing special to it. It is simply a variable that can only be used within that loop. So that's how we get to it, and we're going to talk about that more later. In fact, we're going to get real loopy later. Update. So I can change things. I can replace an element. I can add a new element to the end of the list. And I can, in this case, it's just one of the functions that you're given with lists, because you are given a lot. I can remove the first element from a list. Now, there are way too many. Um, OK, so we'll do delete, and then I'll mention the link. So delete, I can delete, in this case, the third element from a list, or I can delete the list entirely by just having the del keyword and my underscore list or the variable name. Now down here in the slide, I have put a link to the Python document for data structures. And I did that because there is so much information. There is so much we will not be covering about data structures tonight or in this module. Um, so it's, and it's time. If you haven't already started looking online, and I know some of my fellow professors will probably want to throttle me. It is time you go out and start using the internet as a resource if you haven't already. Okay, and this is just one place to start. I use the internet as a professional programmer. I use the internet a lot as a resource because I don't remember everything. I don't know any, well, I know a few people who are that brilliant. I'm not one of them. I have to go out and look things up. So start using the internet. If you want a good place to start, start with the Python documentation. So that creates read a lead for lists. So here's just some of the basics. We're using 6.1.1 as an example. And this is just basically you're, you're figuring out how to modify a list. OK, so I've got my you know, happy Professor Lisa is putting her information in. And we've already done these first two lines. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because we know how to input, we know how to get user input, and we know how to use the split function. Okay? Split works on a string and it works on a list. So if I want to create a list, I use, sorry, sorry, ignore that. Split works to create a list from a string. So we know that, we've done it before. So the first thing I'm going to do, it says, by deleting the first element and changing the last element to Joe. 
So what I did here is I deleted the first element. I used del and names of zero, and it changed the list. It got rid of Gertrude, and it changed it to Sam, Anne, and Joseph. And then the next one I'm going to do is I'm going to change the last element to Joe. Now, originally we had four elements, but when I deleted the first element, we went to three. So when I want to change the last element to Joe, I can basically say names of the last element number minus one equal Joe. So these are just list basics, and they're just how you modify a list. Because one of the things that I have found in my career is that I use data structures all the time. So understanding how to manipulate that list and keep it in a way that's meaningful and accurate is important. Okay. So list methods. Let's see. Do I have any code? I know I have code. Has anybody asked anything yet? Nope. Okay. Um, so 6.1.1. So this is just what we just saw. And I also may seem like I'm going a little fast, but I want to go over some stuff for the game night as well. So if I just run this, I'm going to put in Gertrude and I don't know what it is, Sam. Joseph. Oh, my bad. And it gives me Ann, Sam, and Joe, which is what I would expect. Um, is that just on? Yeah. So list methods. There are a huge number of methods. Again, you want to go out and look at the data structures page. There's too many to even begin to talk about. Some of the things you're going to need, you're going to need count. Okay. You will, you will need that tonight or in this, in the labs. You're going to want sort. You're also going to need append. And at least for the challenge, you're going to need reverse. And i got to change. Sorry, that reference number is wrong. I'll change it. So those are the things, just a few things. But if I go out to the Python documents, if I go to here, Here we go. I have a lot of stuff going on on this page. There's just a massive amount of stuff. And that's OK. These are data structures. You have lists and dictionaries. But just up here is all of the different functions they have for lists. And it explains them to you. And we're just going into a few. So. All right, so let's do a little bit of sorting and reversing. So challenge 621 basically says sort short names in reverse alphabetical order. So what they're really telling you here is to do two things. One is to sort it, and then the other one is to reverse that sort order. So there's two functions, which is the sort and the reverse. So first couple of lines of code we've done again and again and again. Professor Lisa's going to put in Jan. Sam and Joe and Todd. And I'm going to create a list using the split function. Split functions are your friends. I'm going to first sort it. And what sorting does is it, in this case, it recognizes that they're all strings and it puts them in alphabetical order. That's, that is the job of sort. If it recognizes they're all numerics, then it's going to put them in numerical order. And then I want to reverse it. What do I do to reverse it? I call the reverse function. So it's going to reverse the sort. So that is just what a couple of functions do. And these are powerful because when I used to program in C and C++, I had to write my own sort. I had to write my own reverse. They didn't, nobody gave them to us you know, the millennium and a half ago it was. That's kind of a joke, but a long time ago when I was programming um, in C and C++. So it's very powerful that all you have to do is, is throw this stuff over to Python and it comes back and it's correct. Okay, loops and lists. 
loops and lists were made for each other. So right now, we're going to write a loop. This is 6.3.3. So we're going to print all elements in hourly temperature, and they're going to separate the elements with a little arrow-looking thing, surrounded by spaces. So I'm going to input this has to be um, and I'm going to, in this case, I'm going to use index in range. So I could have done a bunch of different things in this um, purpose. So in, in is a very special operator, and I brought it up before, and I'm going to bring it up again. In allows you to do a whole lot of stuff. You can count the index numbers using in by using the range and the length. You can also directly get the elements. And in dictionaries, you're going to be able to get the key value pairs. So in is very powerful, and it is our friend. OK, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to print the hourly temperature at index, ending with a space. And then if the index is not equal to the length of hourly temperature minus 1, which is why I did this as an index value instead of getting the actual element, because I need to stop one before the end. So I don't print out an extra arrow. So let's just take a look at how this goes. So that was a little fast. So at index 0, I'm going to be at 90. 90, and then I'm going to print my arrow, and then, where is it? There we go, 1, that's just way too fast, sorry people. 92 is the next thing I'm going to print out, then I'm going to print an arrow. Now I'm at index 2, and yeah, that's way too fast. So I'm going to print out a 94, because that's at index 2. And I'm going to print out one other arrow. And then I'm going to go a really fast 3, which goes to 95. And then I'm going to print out 95, and I'm done. Because I will never make to that last print statement, because len of hourly temperature minus 1 is um, I am I am greater. No, I'm the same as. So that's just how we're doing a loop through a list. And this is important. That's how you get to data. That's how you're going to learn to manage elastic data is using lists. Okay, the in operator will evaluate each element in order. Okay, so let's go out and look at a little code. And the code is going to start to get a little bit more complex. And this week we start to get pretty complex when it comes to looping. Um, that was 6.3.1. Oh, that's, this is another one. That's 6.3. So here's 6.3.3, .3, and we can watch it do its thing in my favorite tool in any IDE, which is the debugger. 6.3.3. OK. Oh, this is wrong. Yep. There we go. Whoops, what did I do wrong? That's what I did wrong. Okay, so if we just run through this, let me make it a little smaller. We'll just stop here at the 4. So I'm just going to put 90, 91, 92, and 93. So, what happens? I have hourly temperature of 90, 91, 92, and 93. My count index is going to be 0. Hold 
Why didn't I print anything? If counter equal. Oh, this is just wrong. I apologize. I'll get this fixed. I don't know why I typed it in this way. That was just wrong. Not equal. All right. Apologize for this. All right, let's start this again. Okay. 90, 91, 92, 93. Okay. So I'm at zero. I'm going to print out. I'm going to go to console. I'm going to print that out. Counter is well within the range, so I'm going to print that out. Oops. Oh, that's why I did it like that. I was trying to be clever, just very clever, and I really wasn't clever. Must have been trying something out. There we go. All right, let's give it another shot. Third time's the charm. Okay. I'm just going to put one, two, three, and four because I'm sick of typing two numbers tonight. Okay. So I am going to step over. I'm going to print one. I'm going to print the arrow, two. And again, I like the debugger because I can see what's going on. Three and the end, four, and we're done. So now we're getting into nested loops. And I don't have all my graphics right on here. Obviously, I don't. But we're going to go to what we have. All right, so what Challenge 6.5.1 does is it says print the two dimensional list multi table by row and column. What we're talking about here when we're dealing with multi-dimensional lists or we're dealing, excuse me, with nested loops is we're dealing with matrices. So most of the time I deal with a matrix that is just X and Y. And you can deal with matrices that are X, Y, and Z um, or however many nestings you're going to have. So here we said two-dimensional list. That means I'm going to have two loops. I'm going to have one outer loop and one inner loop, and they're going to be nested. Um, so that's what a nested loop is. And the way the behavior of the inner loop is going to affect the behavior of the outer loop. Um, so let's just go through the example. If I'm not being clear, please let me know. So. I have some user input, and that user input is 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, 6, 3, 6, 9. And you'll notice that there are three letters separated by a space, and then a comma, and then another three numbers with spaces in between, separated by a comma, and another three numbers. So this is flat right now. This is what we would call flat data. And I want to turn that flat data into a multidimensional table. So let we um did I, I just I just did not talk about that, did I? Well we'll talk about it now. Ask me questions. I just realized that there might be a hole in these slides where I didn't give you guys enough information. Let me know. So I'm gonna take this flat data and I'm gonna turn it into a multidimensional table, so a, a list, a multidimensional list. So I'm going to change, first of all, I'm going to split my user input by comma, and now I have three elements in a list. I have one space, two space, three, and then two space, four space, six, and three space, six space, nine. 
So I have turned flat data into a somewhat structured but still flat data. So I want to populate a table. So I'm going to create an empty list called table. Table is just a variable. That's all it is. I know it's an empty list because on the right-hand side of the single equal sign are square brackets with nothing in them. Okay, so this is my outer loop. Okay, I'm going to have an outer loop and an inner loop, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So my outer loop is going to say for row counter in range len rows. Now, I named this up here rows on purpose. If you have ever seen an Excel spreadsheet, you know that it has rows and columns. And that's what multidimensional lists are, are rows and columns. So, and you can, you can have more than rows and columns. You can make them very, very detailed. But for right now, we're sticking with two dimensions. So, um, I've, I've started with the the information as rows. These are my three, these are what are going to be my three rows. So I have four row counter in range len rows. So I'm going to go through this list based on the index number. When I say len rows here, oh, sorry about that. Um, when I say len rows here, it means I'm really going through it based on the index number, not based on the element because I need that index number. So I have, I've just called it cells. It's a variable. Because I'm splitting one, two, three by space. So I have the first element of my rows. Oh, sorry. I'll fix this. This is wrong. Um, I have the first element in my rows, and I'm going to split them. So I have a list of 1, 2, 3. Now I'm going to create another empty list. And I'm creating that other empty list as a temporary storage spot. OK? So I now have just created an inner loop. And this is for cell counter in range the length of cell. So it will be 0, 1, and 2. And I, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take these and I'm going to populate row. So I'm going to have row 1, 2, and 3, and then I am going to append that to the table. So I'm going to create, I'm going to append the cell at cell counter, create an integer, and append it to row. So the first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to have a 1, and I'm going to go back up to the top of that loop. And I'm then going to have a 1, 2. And then I'm going to have a 1, 3. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. The top of the loop is going to say, oh, wait a minute, do the next thing. And the next thing is the line outside the loop, which appends that row that I just created to the table. Now you'll notice here that I have two left square brackets and two right square brackets. And that means I have a multidimensional list. So I have a list inside of another list. And the way that works is 1, 2, and 3 in those square brackets is considered for table the zero index. So you can have a list inside of a list. And then we're going to go back up to the outer loop. And with the outer loop, we're now going to have 2, 4, and 6. We're going to have 2, 4, and 6 there. Oops, sorry. The graphics aren't quite right on this. I'm just going to do this fast, and then we'll talk about it. Sorry about that. Here. There we go. So. Then we're going to output what's going on with that table. And again, I'm going to have a multidimensional list. And in this list, I'm going to go through table. And actually, I think I have this in code, so that might just be better. 
Which one was this? Oops. This was 5-1. Uh, yep, we have this in code. So we have 5-1 here. So let, let me go back and talk about this a little better. So you can have a list inside of another list, and that's where I should have started. Um, an element in a list can be anything. It can be a number. It can be an object, which we're going to find out about in Module 8. It can be another list. It can be a dictionary. It can be all kinds of things. When you have a list that contains another list as an element, we have to know how to get at the things inside that inner list. And the way we do that is we use multidimensional for um, let me through this and not for example. Uh, dictionary nested list. Let me see if this one's better. Okay. So this one might be a little bit easier to understand what I'm talking about. And I'm sorry for being scattered tonight. So I have this thing called nested. So this is a list with three other lists in it. So what do I have here? I have an open square bracket and a corresponding closed square bracket. I'm going to have a list. That's what that tells me. Inside that, I have things that are surrounded by square brackets. And that's indeed another list. So the first element of nested, the thing that is at the zero index at, at on nested, is another list. And the second element is another list. And the third element is another list. So how do I get to that? Well, I get to that by using nested notation, which is basically instead of just one square bracket with the index in it, I have a square bracket with the index of the row and a square bracket with the index of the column. Let me run this for you. And uh, what is this nested list? We can kind of see that. So let me just run this. So if you look at this notation, there we go. Zero of this is nested of zero of zero is one. So if I have nested, this is nested of zero that whole list, that 1, 2, 3. So how do I get to 1? I get to 1 by giving it another square bracket with 0 in it because for this list, 1 is 0. So 0 of 0 is 1. 0 of 1 is 2. Still, 0 is always this list, so I'm still in that list. 0 of 2 is 3. Again, I'm in 0. And then 1 is another 0. 2 is a, is a 1. And 3 is a 2. And then we do the same thing again for element 1 of nested. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about this nested list notation. And I'm sorry I didn't say that earlier. Um, so here is, in fact, the right code for this. So let's run through that in the debugger, and then I will go fix the code in my slide. What is this one? Six, six, five, one. Six, five, one. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I am taking a nest, I'm taking user input that is going to be a nested list, and I, I want to create a table. I want to create a multidimensional array out of it. So I am going to debug, and I'm just going to put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. All separated. Right. 
I know the input is interrupted. Let's try this again. Debug. I had this problem earlier. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And there we go. So I have rows, and I'm going to have one list. We can see it's a single list here because when I look at the debugger, it shows me that I just have one list. I have one set of square braces. And inside that, I have three different elements. I have one element that's a string with one space, two space, three. I have a second element that is another string with four, four space, five space, six, and I have the last one, which is a string with seven space, eight space, nine. Now I want to turn this into a, a multi-dimensional table of numbers. So how do I do that? Well, first I create an empty table. I got to have some place to put it. I have to define it before I can put anything in it. So I'm going to say for row counter in range len rows, okay, my row counter is zero. My cells is going to be rows of row counter dot split. Well, right here is rows of row counter, that one, two, and three. So in that line, what happens is I now have one, two, and three, which is a row is just a very line, and but it is an empty list because I have to have some place to put it. I have to define some place to put it before I can put it there. So now for cell in range length of cells, I have. I'm going to add it to the row. So row now has one. I've just updated cell counter to one. So row has one and two. And then row has two and three. And then I exit the inner loop. And I add row. I append row to table. So table now has a value has information in it. Table has, in fact, a list. So now we're going to do the same thing. And we'll see table up here changed. So now we're going to do the same thing for 4, 5, and 6. So I'm going to create a, a list called row. And I'm going to add 4, 5, and 6 as integers to it. And then I'm going to come out of the inner loop. I'm going to append my new row to table. And table now has two elements, which are each list. And then I'm going to do it for the final time. And I've just appended it. So now I'm going to output. OK, so I now have another variable called row. This is just to demonstrate that this row and this row are completely separate. So I'm going to say for every row in table, I want to get the new numerator. What numerator does is it tells Python, for this element in the row, don't just get me the element, get me its index as well. So last week when we dealt with multi-returns, you know, you could return several different things from a function. This is a function that does that. It's provided by Python, and its job is to get us both the value and the index of an element in a table. So I'm going to have index is 0, cell is 1. Now I'm going to print. Let's go to the console. You can see I'm starting to print. And I'm just going to go through the printing. For each row, it's on a row in the screen. And they're separated by pipes. So that is a multidimensional list. How you read it in, how you create it, 
and how you evaluate it. Stop. Okay. So let's keep going because we're going to run late tonight. I apologize. All right. Dictionaries. Dictionaries are the other kind of container or data structure that Python gives us. D dictionaries are key value pairs and basically what you, um, anything can be a key. Um, sorry, that should have said value. It's an unordered collection so it doesn't have an index number. Sorry about that. Okay. Let's go to the next one. So let's talk a little bit about dictionaries here. What is a dictionary? Well, how do I know it's a dictionary first? I know a list because it has square brackets. With a dictionary, it has curly brackets. So if you see a curly bracket on the left and a curly bracket on the right, and it's after an equal sign, then you know it's a dictionary. And a dictionary has members, keys, and values and specific syntax. So what is this specific syntax? Well, the syntax is, start, I have a variable, it's on the left-hand side of single equal sign. I have an open curly brace, then I have some string, integer, whatever I want, a colon, and then string, integer, float, object, whatever I want. Um, that is a member. And inside a member is a key and a value. Key is always to the left. Value is always to the right. So if I look at my key value pairs that I have in my dictionary, I have a key that's called name and a value. I have a key called age and a value 42. And I have a key called amount and a value of 3.14. Now, you'll notice here when I'm talking, some of these key and values make sense, and that's really what the associative array is for. You want, for me, I want to have a descriptive key and then a value for that key that's a unique piece of information that I need, and the name, sorry, the key is how I'm going to get to that piece of information that I need, which is in the value. So dictionary has CRUD just like lists have CRUD. So I'm going to create. When I create a dictionary, I'm going to create a dictionary by using the open and close curly brackets. I can also create a populated dictionary where I, I just have key value pairs. And by the way, each key value pair in a dictionary must be separated by commas. Read, that's, you just read it, and instead, it looks, this looks very much like a list. You got very, you got you got information and the square bracket. In this case, the difference between a dictionary and a list when you're reading something is the dictionary uses the key that you get to it, not the index value. So you are always going to be using that key, whatever it is. Update. If I have, whoops, boy, I didn't do a good job. I apologize. All right, so for updating, Whoops. All right, update. There we go. So let's get back to where we were. Okay. So, update is we're going to modify it because dictionaries are mutable. So, I can have a dictionary, my dict, the key, in this case the key is name, and then Fred. And then I can append, I'm just going to call it 
the the uh, value sorry the key is going to be new and the value will be val and this is how you add a new element to the dictionary in a list we had to append but in a dictionary we're just going to um sorry that's wrong i'll fix that okay so to delete a dictionary you say del my dict okay you just say del delete and the dictionary name so I've just talked about associative arrays. We have figured out how to loop over a list, and it all makes sense because there are indexes. Well, how in the world do you iterate over a dictionary because it is an unordered collection? Well, you do it very similarly to how you do it for lists. You just use a couple of extra. So in challenge 16.1, you're going to write a loop that prints each country's population and country in country pop. So this one's kind of complex. We're going to be doing a lot in here. Um, and I didn't use the data exactly the way they have it in the challenge because it was just too much on the slide. So I abbreviated a lot of it. So Professor Lisa is going to put in the data. Now the data is nicely formatted. Formatted, it has in this case C colon 136, I colon 124, US 318, O is 252. So I have things that are comma separated and colon separated. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to split it by comma. Okay? The comma basically is the first way to separate the data. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to separate the data. So I can put it into a structure that's usable for me. So I'm going to create an empty dictionary called country pop. I know it's an empty dictionary because it has a clo close, open and close curly brackets. And then I say for pair in entries. Entries is right here. It's my list. I have a list of four strings. So then I'm going to say for pair in entries. Pair is just a variable name. Get that because I've defined it. It's local to the list. Entries is my list. So I'm going to split them on the colon. So the first time I split them on the colon, I'm just going to get C136. So that's its own list now. And then I'm going to add C, 136 as a key value pair in country pop. So what that's going to be, it's going to be like this. Country pop is now going to equal C is my key and 136 is my value. I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop. I'm now going to have my second element in the list, which is I24, is now going to be Split and I have a list with I as the first element and 124 as the second. So I then now have a country pop with two key value pairs because I have added it. And we're going to go here to US. The same thing happens. I now have three things in my um, dictionary. I'm going to go back through. I've got the last one. I'm now going to have the last thing in the dictionary. So this basically shows you how you populate a dictionary from a list. And by the way, I'm going to go back up. I'm now done. So I've got this new for loop here. And this is kind of the first time we've seen this because I have four country comma pop in country pop dot item. That dot item is a method that is used on a dictionary that returns to you the key and the value in that order. So if I am, I just want both. I don't want one, I want both. So I can now get the key, which is country, and the value, which is pop. And so oh, I just mentioned items. So now I'm going to print the country has pop people. Sorry. So that 
is dictionaries. So before we go on to the labs, or actually let me ask you guys, um, we can go through the labs and then I'm going to do a kind of a semi-example of, um, sorry, my brain. I'm going to do an example of some of the things you're going to have to do for your game. So do you want me to go over that now or do you want me to go over the labs and those people who don't want to stay for that, they can just get off the call? Somebody want to give me some ideas of what they want? Game? Okay. Anybody against game? Okay. All right. So we're going to just go into some code here. And this is similar to what you might do for your game. Uh, let's see. Is this it? Yes. So I have, um, I have a couple pieces of information. So let's just start off here at the top. In my game, I have four directions, up, down, left, right. And you will see that I've created them as a list. Now I don't need to worry about any, I don't need to worry about the variable size, no elasticity to this list. But I always, I want something where I can check the direction easily. So I put them in a list. And now I have a place where I can say, is the direction the user entered in my direction list? If it is, then great, keep going. If it's not, then stop. Um, and actually, I should say that differently because that's not the way you're going to want to evaluate it. You're going to want to evaluate it by saying, is the direction not in the direction list? Is the user input not in the direction list? If it's not, then you have a validation problem and you have to say, hey, sorry, you didn't enter the right thing. The other data structure I have here is rooms, okay? Rooms is a dictionary. I know it's a dictionary because I have a left and a right curly brace. I have three rooms, room one, room two, and room three. Those are my keys. They're the names of the rooms. So what do I have for values? What I have for values is a dictionary because I can do that. I know it's a dictionary because it's got curly braces around it. It's got uh, a key, at least one key value pair separated by a colon. That's how I know it's a dictionary. So what this is saying, the way I structured this is for room one, there is a direction and what happens when I come from that, when I come from that direction. So for room one, I'm allowed to go up and that will get me to room two. For room two, again, room two is just key. The value is, in fact, a dictionary. And this dictionary has more than one entry. This has two entries. I can go, if I go up, sorry, if I go down, I'll go back to room one. If I go right, I will go to room three. That's what that says. So I have two options, two move options here. So if I had a map and I had two arrows going out of that, map, out of that box on that map, I need two entries in that inner dictionary for that room. Um, so for room three, room three is the key. I know it's a key because it's in a dictionary and it's on the left hand side of a colon. If I haven't said that before, the key is always on the left hand side of the colon and the value is always on the right. Room three as its value has a dictionary, the dictionary has a direction followed by a colon and then the value which is the room. So in room three, if I go left, I get to room two. That's how you read that. So I have a, a function to define the instructions. Um, when you're doing your game, now these are not the right instructions. You when you when you define your instructions, you're going to have to figure out what you want to say. This is just quick and easy. This has nothing to do with the game. It's just 
showing you guys what you might have to do. So I'm going to define a function, and this is just going to be called instructions. For my instructions, I'm passing in the room because I want to tell them something about the room. Um, and I'm just giving them some information, and I'm checking to make sure that the directions are in the, I've called it direct. If it is in direction, um, sorry, for direct in direction, so I'm going to go through each of the elements in direction, and I'm going to print the direction, and then I'm going to tell them play, stop to quit. So instead of re having redundancy here and actually typing in up, down, up, I'm just going to print the instruction straight from the list. It just makes more sense, less code, less time. So I have a function called in room. And in room takes a room in a direction. And I'm saying, where do I want to go to? So rooms of room. So I have the current room. And I'm going to get that room. So let's assume it was room two. I'm going to get the room. And then I'm going to get the dictionary associated with the room, which tells me where I get to go. And then I can determine whether the input is valid. If the direction is not, if, if what they've given me is not in where to, which just means it is not a key in that particular room, then I'm going to print, sorry, can't do it, and I'm going to return the room. Otherwise, I'm going to say, yep, you were able to change rooms, and I'm going to return the new room that I'm in. And then I have the gameplay loop. So I have stop equal to go. Stop is my sentinel value. I've got to set it equal to something. So in this case, I've set it equal to go. Oh, I'm just going to make this room one. Sorry. So my current room is room one. As long as stop is not Q, is not quit, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to have user input, which I'm going to give it the instructions and tell it the current room. I'm now going to try and eliminate things. Before I go in check my rooms at all, I'm going to get I'm going to do the quickest thing first, which is if this is bad input, just keep on going. Don't even bother checking the rooms. So, user input, if that's quit, I'm going to break and I'm done with the game. If user input is not in the directions, which means it's not right, and I'm continue, which is me back up to the top of the while loop. And it's just going to keep asking them. they got to print the right, they got to input the right thing. If the input is valid, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and change the room. Okay? I'm going to try and see if I am, if I'm room one, can I change it? If I'm room two, can I change it? If I'm room three, can I change it? So let's do a little bit of debugging. So let's go to directions, directions. Okay. So I am now debugging. Oh, sorry. No. Now I'm debugging. So my current room is going to be room one. I'm going to step over that. My sentinel is not Q, so I'm going to step into it. It's going to say, give me a direction. So I am going to say, what's my allowed direction? I'm going to say up, up. So my direction is up. My user input is up. And so I'm going to check. If user input is Q, I'm going to break. If it's not in direction, I'm going to continue. Otherwise, my current room is room one. Now you'll notice I set current room outside the while loop because I have to know what room I'm starting in. So if you're starting in the great hall, the, before you go into that while loop, your current room is defined as great hall. If it's the bridge, 
then it's the bridge. It's, if it's the living room or the library, then it's the living room or the library. So that's the place you're going to start your game. When that user player, when that player is plunked down someplace, they're going to be plunked down into that current room. So my current room is room one, and that's okay. So I am now going to step into this function. So let's see what happens here. Where to, let's go back to variables, variables, where to is up room two. Well, how did I get there? What I have is I have my rooms dictionary. The room is room one. So if I look up here in my rooms dictionary, for room one, I have that dictionary, which has a direction, and the next room based on that direction. So, whoops, sorry about that. If I, I have up and room two. So my direction is up, and where two has a key value pair, and I'm going to say if direct is not in where two, but it is because it's up. So I am going to change rooms for where to of direct. So this where to is up and room to. Direct is up. So I am going to get room to because where to, room one, four up is room two. I hope that's clear. So it says it's changing rooms and it changes rooms. So now I come back here and my current room all of a sudden becomes room two. So that's how you change rooms and that's how you're going to move um, your player around your board. Okay? So now I'm going to go and I'm going to ask him again because I'm still inside the while loop. So I'm going to input this and I'm going to input uh, 42, just 42. So I come back out here. My user input is 42. By the way, for those in my class, expect that I'm going to put in bad data. Expect that I'm going to do that because I am. I want to see what happens if I put in data that I know is wrong. So is user input, if user input is not in direction, wow, 42 is not in the direction list. I guarantee you. So what's going to happen is I'm going to print out, oops, so sorry, and I'm going to go back up to the top of the loop because that's what a continue does. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to test Q. So Q, I now have quit. So I have user input is Q, and so I'm going to break out of the loop. So this is a little bit about what you need to do for your game. Okay? The other list that you're going to want to keep for your game is the list of items. So you've got items in your rooms, and people are going to go pick up an item. When people get an item, it means you're adding that item to the list after you've checked the item list to make sure the thing isn't already in there. So that's the other important list. The other important data structure that you're going to have here is the items. And that is how you will know if you get to the wrong place in your game and that user doesn't have everything in their item list, then they're going to die. The game's going to be over and they're going to have lost. So are there any questions about some of these hints for the game? And by the way, all of this code will be up on the YouTube site. Okay, does everybody understand what I'm trying to say here? How do you check to make sure all the items are in the list when you get to the room? Well, you know 
how many items there needs to be in a list. If you have eight rooms and only six of them have items, then you check the length and say, do you have all of the items? Or if you want to be a little bit more um, precise about it, you can have a list of items just like you have directions and then you can make you can go through that list and say are all the items there is you know item a in my the list that the user the player you know did the player go and get that item because it's in their list my suggestion is for this game you simply check the length so if your user only has two things in their list and you have seven rooms where you have items, then they haven't got all their items. That, that would be my suggestion. So if you have questions about it, go ahead and put it in the chat. And I'm going to go back for the time being, and we will talk about the labs. OK. So labs 6.12 and 6.13 are about lists. Labs, what is it, 6.17 and 6.18 are about dictionaries. So 6.12 is varied amount of input data, and this is the pseudocode for that. So if I look at 6.12, OK. So this lab basically says, um, Statistics are calculated by, with varying amounts of input data. Write a program that takes any number of integers as input and outputs the average and the max. So it, Zybooks might put in four things. It might put in seven things, like ten things. So you have to be capable of dealing with that elastic input, because you don't know how many input data, how much input data Zybooks is going to give you. It could give you two things. It could give you 15. So you want to use a list because it's elastic. Yes. So, oh, no problem, Joseph. So let's go look at the pseudocode for that. And the pseudocode basically is you get user input. We always get user input when we're dealing with iBooks. I've got a variable called tokens, and I'm going to split that input up based on a space. And I know that it's based on a space because the example that Zybooks gave me has spaces in between the numbers. So I've added a comment here about converting it. And I'm going to create an empty list called input data for each of the tokens, for a token in tokens. So it's just, I'm now going through my tokens. Uh, I have a list of strings that have integers in them. So I want to append token to the input data. And then um, I'm going to get the average and I'm going to get the max. So there, to get the average, you just sum the input data up and you divide by the length of the input data. And for the max value, you basically just do max. I think you can do max on a list. Let's double check me. Um, I think there's already a function. There's a max function for that. So when you're getting the max, just say max and give it the list. That's all you do. You don't have to write your own max function. Python gives that one to you. Um, OK, so now let's do 6.13, which is filter and sort. So you're going to program integers and output non-negative integers in ascending order. So you're going to have to get rid of the negatives and then print them from lowest to highest, print the positive numbers from lowest to highest. So let's look and see how that's done. I have get user input, as I always do. I have tokens, just because I like the word tokens for, for module six. I have input data, 
So now I go through and I'm going through for each token in my tokens list. I'm going to check. So is the token greater than zero? If it is, then append it to um, the input data because I have an empty list. So I said append token to input data. So I'm taking this token because I know it's positive and I'm adding it to the empty list that I created. Then I'm going to sort it. Remember those four list functions that I said were going to come in handy? Sort is one of them. You don't have to write your own code to sort. You simply sort the list. And then I go and I just print it out. And I make sure that I have a space in between each one. So this, that, that is what you do. The, the majority of this work is just determining if it is a non-negative number. So it's got to be greater than zero before you put it in that list. So that's 6.13. 6.18 is going to be our first dictionary. And let's go see what 6.18 says. 6.18. Okay, so write a program that reads a list of words, then the program outputs those words and their frequencies. So the frequency is just how many times did that word show up. So let's go back to here. And we're going to have um, user input is just going to be input of value. User sentence, you're going to split it. Um, Oh, sorry, this isn't a dictionary. For index and user sentence, um, why did I tell you to do that? Okay. Okay, so we're just going to iterate it over the list and count whether or not how many times the index, the value is in the sentence. Is that right? I feel like something's not right about that. Count. You need to use the count function. That's why. Sorry, my brain. Okay. Count occurrences in list. Okay. That's what you want to do. And the count function. Count occurrences in Python is with the account with the count method. So that's what I meant by that pseudocode. Okay. Basically what I'm doing is I'm saying for that word in the sentence, count the number of times it happens. And then print it out. That's all you do. You're going to output the where you are in that sentence and the count of where you are in that sentence. And then just keep going until you're done. So this is a for loop over a list, and you're using the count function. 6.19. OK, 6.19, replacement words. So you're basically get, just going to have a send, uh, 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 sorry, a script that replaces words in a sentence. Um, Word replacement pairs, the original placement. Um, so you're going to have automobile and car. Manufacturer is going to be changed to maker, and children is going to be changed to kids. So basically, these are key value pairs. That's what they are. So what it currently is is going to be on the left-hand side, and what you want it to be is going to be on the right-hand side. So what do we do here? What we do here is we get our user input. We're going to create a dictionary called word pairs. So a dictionary is just an empty dictionary is just left curly bracket and right curly bracket. Now we're going to split into something called tokens. So we have um, a list of each of those words, but we really want to pair. We don't just want to so what I do, I go through the list, I think, I loop through that list, and I basically say add word pairs, the 
Um, so the current token you're on plus the next token is the key value pair. So that's what you're going to want to do. You're going to want to take the, the, the first element and the second element and add them to word pairs. And then you're going to want to take the third element and the fourth element. So you have to make sure that you're incrementing that list by two or it's not going to work. So you're going to have a range in uh, tokens and then comma two and that should do it. Um, yeah. So and then you're actually going to print out what's in, you're going to do the replacement. So you're going to find the original word, which is going to be the key, and you're going to replace that with the value. And you're going to use the dot items function to get the key and the value for this for loop. So I understand that this week is considerably more complex and the next two weeks are also going to be more complex. You've got a really complex assignment coming up too. So is there anything I can do to help you with your game or is there anything I can do to help make this week's material clear or more clear? And by the way, you guys can turn on your... Um, mics if you want to and just talk. Okay. Going once. Oh, there we go. That's fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is, is 6.12. Yes, you do have to convert the tokens to an integer. Yes, token equals int. Um, actually, it would be... Um, you would probably, this is where pseudocode gets a little bit weird. Yeah, you would, um, you would basically say input data dot append and then inside the append would be an int, open parentheses, the token, close parentheses for the int, close parentheses for the append. That's what you would do. So this is where pseudocode can get a little messy. Because on one line I'm telling you to convert it, and the next, no, the next line I'm telling you to append it, but I'm not really telling you how to do that in the language. So you want to use int to convert token and append it to input data, and you can do that all on one line. Cool. No problem. Does anybody have any other questions? I'm assuming no one does. And so I am going to stop the recording. I'm going to end the call.